by the way, I am going to do another giveaway on this video. I'm going to select a few people who like the video and comment down below to win my newest Freedom and Farming t-shirt. Since some people are lame and want to scam all my loyal followers, make sure you do your due diligence. And if you see a reply on your comment from a page that looks like mine, double check, click on the page and make sure it's actually my channel, not some random person trying to steal your hard-earned money. This is both a beautiful and a concerning sight at the same time. We have a morning dew on the leaves of our corn plants. This is good because it means that we have moisture in the atmosphere, humidity, and our corn plants are probably getting an adequate amount of H2O every day. It's bad because leaf wetness, dew, and overall humidity are one of the leading factors causing disease pressure in your cornfields. More often than not, diseases in your cornfield are silent yield robbers. We are looking at northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot, southern rust, and of course tar spot, which is a newer opponent in the arena. There are a handful of ways to protect your crop and your bottom line from this disease pressure. If you put 2021 and 2022 side by side in terms of the growing season, we're actually a few weeks beyond where we were last year when we started applying fungicides to our corn crop. This just comes down to how dry our June was. Most of these diseases that affect our corn plants really love leaf wetness and just overall moisture content, morning dews, because they're conducive to rapid growth and spreading of those diseases, fungi, especially ones like tar spot and southern rust. New crop corn prices do support applying a product like this. It's about a six bushel cost. So if we can return at least six bushels, we have a return on our investment. That being said, the data on corn fungicides is not nearly as supportive or reliable as soybean fungicides. The efficacy and statistical reliability of corn fungicides just isn't quite in line with that of soybean fungicides, which we are gonna apply every single year. Corn fungicides are more of a game time decision based on crop conditions, yield potential, growing season conditions, and a variety of other factors. There are some seasons when your corn crop needs as much help from outside pressures as it can get. There are other seasons where it holds its own pretty fine. However, with very supportive new crop corn prices, it does make sense to protect your bushels. The reason diseases rob yield, especially in a silent manner, is that they overtake the leaf surface reducing photosynthetic area. These fungi also infest the plant stock, which are arguably just as important as the leaves because they are the transport system of nutrients, both upward and downward. Ultimately, the indirect effect of both of these factors result in a lower yield, either through lesser quantity of kernels or lesser density of each kernel. As the plant deteriorates, it's essentially the factory designed to produce kernels of corn shutting down, losing effectiveness, and reducing overall yield. Last growing season, we called in the applicator the minute we saw tassels shooting because we were afraid that we were gonna have a lot of that disease pressure. This year, with the drier growing season, we actually kicked the can down the road and waited till a further growth stage because we didn't think we would get as much for our money if we applied it early when there was not a lot going on within the plant. We've been keeping an eye on these corn plants and we've now reached the stage where we are comfortable applying that because we're gonna be focusing on building this ear and that is brown silk. There are some silks in here that aren't completely brown with the lag time and application and other factors, really once you start to see a good amount of brown silks on your corn plant, you hit that milk stage in the ear, it's time to go ahead and call in the applicator to spray your fungicide, unless of course you have reason to do so earlier. This is a pretty good ear size for a cornfield at about a 36,000 plants per acre population. We are seeing some tip back or failed pollination here. That could be from weather conditions and or insect feeding. Overall though, High quality, high yield potential, we wanna protect that. Okay, that's enough cornfield for me for a couple weeks. Why is it that the spots that look like this are always right next to the road? Could that not have been just out in the middle of the field where only the helicopter pilot would see it? There goes a nutrient. Head to finish up our last batch of soybean fungicide and insecticide. Now keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, soybeans are not a game time decision like corn. Corn really depends on the year when you want to apply it. Soybeans, that's very black and white. Once they hit the third reproductive growth stage or a 3 16 of an inch pod, four fully formed nodes from the top, so we go four down, boom, right there. 3 16 of an inch pod, 
it is time to apply your fungicide and insecticide to your soybean crop. To clarify, we only add the insecticide to our soybeans, not our corn. For some reason, these soybean plants are like a steak dinner to Japanese beetles and a few other hard-shelled insects that really like to ruin our day, our plants, and of course, our top end yield potential. On corn, we just don't quite see the delicacy for these insects. They do like to chew on some silk, so if you were gonna spray it, it needed to be sprayed probably a couple weeks ago, right after the tassel shot. Again though, just not strong enough evidence on our farm to justify throwing an unnecessary 10 to $15 at your corn crop when it doesn't return. These beans just look phenomenal. A few more rains, this is gonna be a monster crop. For our corn fungicide program this year, we are using Syngenta's Trivipro. A lot of people are making use of Syngenta's Mirvis Neo, and of course, BASF has Valtima, all very strong products. The reason we're going with Trivipro is because Syngenta claims that it has slightly better southern rust protection than their Mirvis Neo product. They say that Mirvis Neo, although it's still strong on southern rust, is better against tar spot. We're farther enough south in Illinois that we're more concerned about the possibility of southern rust coming up. It's not guaranteed. However, if it does come, and that is an if, I am going to reiterate that because it's entirely based on weather conditions down south, jet stream, tropical storms. It cannot overwinter in Illinois. If it does come up here, though, it proliferates incredibly quick and can absolutely decimate a cornfield, stealing up to 40 or 50 percent of your yield because it essentially just eradicates the leaves on the plant with the rust pustules and spreads like a wildfire. So that's basically why we are going with Trivapro. We've had great success with it. And of course, Syngenta always stands behind their product and creates some very good technology for corn plants. Though I'd like to pretend that we can just snap our finger and have Nutrien and Heli Team, who they're partnered with, come up and spray our corn. It's not that simple. And we've actually turned all of our corn acres in about four or five days ago, anticipating that the helicopter would be around and of course that our corn would be ready to spray. So we're gonna keep our eyes and ears open. Hopefully we see that chopper soon. I got really excited because I heard the audible chop of a helicopter and I was looking and looking and I couldn't find it. And then way out yonder, I see two helicopters flying in formation, which I doubt the aerial applicators do. So I would imagine that those are military helicopters. Probably looking for those funky plants out in our fields. I just took off from what I was doing to come see and now I'm kind of disappointed. <sighs> but is it really even a normal day on the farm if there isn't a little bit of disappointment involved?
The aerial applicator is getting close to being halfway done applying corn fungicide on our acres. However, we have made the mutual decision to take a temporary hiatus because there are some rain showers moving across the countryside. As you can see right here, our predictions were accurate. Although it does not take the fine mist being applied to our corn plants to dry on a day like today, maybe five or 10 minutes, we really don't wanna to fly too close to the sun because we do have a lot invested on every acre. Between the fungicide and application fees, we're looking at 35 or $40. When you get a shower like this in too close a proximity, you're gonna wash all of that very important and expensive product off of your corn plants. I'm really thankful that the heli team pays pretty close attention to details on top of my surveillance just for the fact that they want to ensure that the quality of work they're doing is superb. They don't want the product to fail on our acres any more than we do. And of course it does not hurt that the helicopter can come back out once it's dried off 45 minutes after the rain subsided because ground conditions are irrelevant when they're in the sky. I'd say we made the right call to stop the helicopter for a short amount of time. Besides, they've been working since 6 a.m., so I don't think a little bit of a break would hurt them. I'd say that's going to move through relatively quickly. They'll be back out spraying in no time. Just like clockwork, there goes the spray helicopter back to finish the field it was working on about 45 minutes after it stopped raining. Sun's out now. Things should go pretty quickly. Prior to the tiny bit of moisture we had, it actually wasn't really that unpleasant to be outside, even in a long sleeve shirt. Now that it's rained though, it is absolutely brutal out here. Hot and humid, great growing weather, terrible weather to be me. I can see him off in the distance, probably three or four miles to the west. I would imagine he's gonna be moving in here close to home soon. The heli team's actually got a rather impressive setup here. The combination of a skilled helicopter pilot with an efficient and talented crewman results in just an unbelievable amount of throughput. The amount of acres per hour they can cover, especially in large fields, is just out of this world. I don't think the traditional spray plane or air tractor would be able to directly compete just for the fact that the airport isn't 20 miles away. The airport is wherever that tinder truck's parked. Of course, there are some additional considerations. They said they always want to take off into the wind. They have to watch out for power lines and other obstructions. Once you get those things hammered out though, you've got a recipe for success. The pilot we have, which is the same one who sprayed our bean acres last year with fungicide, although very skilled, is also insane. I can only imagine the roller coaster ride it is there in the cockpit, just to be zipping around, whipping around as fast as they turn. They load on the truck and take off in less than one minute. They're spraying 40 acres a tank at two gallons an acre. The crew said that as long as they're in decent fields not chopped up with not many obstructions like power lines and with favorable weather 1500 to 2000 acres isn't out of the question although that is kind of asking a lot by the time they move around and have to do the logistical stuff not to mention a lot of people don't just have big 200 or 300 acre fields there's a lot of 40s and 30s here and there so that definitely slows you down i know it slows us down the planner so helicopter they're not gonna be any better. You wanna talk about yield. Look at these Asgro 35 XF1s, potted to the gills. This might be a record breaker out here. Look at them all. If we get another big rain, one to two inches here, the end of July going into August, I can only imagine what our yield potential is gonna be, especially on our soybeans. Our corn crop for the most part, other than protecting our bushels with products like fungicide, is relatively made just for the simple fact that they could access moisture from so far into the ground. We successfully got through that pollination stage, so we do have kernels to fill. It's just a matter of making sure that those kernels don't get robbed of weight by diseases. So, pretty confident with our crop. Soybeans are gonna need maybe one or two more rains in the heart of August. All things considered though, the pedal is to the metal. These factories are churning and we're gonna have a lot of output.
they put it down for about five minutes, never shut it off, and then go back to it. Not even enough rain to knock what we sprayed off the leaves. But when it's this humid, it doesn't take much to stir up a storm. He sprang far enough ahead of the rain that it shouldn't be an issue, but they're not going to be able to get much more until this subsides. I'd say that that's not the greatest for productivity. Especially with the rain this hard, it's going to take a little bit longer to dry off. And unlike a few hours ago, I don't know if the sun or the heat are going to be joining us again today, so they may have to pull the plug for the rest of the evening. They do like the plants to be dry before they apply. Of course, we like it as well because we want that product to adhere to the leaves. It is a bad time of year, though, to turn away a rain, especially given the June we've been through. I'm willing to deal with the inconvenience of a rain out for our aerial applicator because any rain we get at this point is a moneymaker. Although we've been fighting unexpected showers all day, can't really complain with how much they've gotten done. They're gonna keep going probably for another three hours until the sun sets. They've just absolutely devoured all of our corn acres as well as worked on a few other farmers along the way. They do keep the logistics in mind. If they have a field next to a field they're at, they're gonna spray those and they wanna work their way in a specific direction for the sake of efficiency, not only for the helicopter, but also for the tender truck because it's easier to get those things done while they're there as opposed to zigzag around to different people's farms. From what I saw last season and of course what they've done so far for us this growing season, I cannot speak highly enough about the heli team. Their attention to detail, specifically this pilot, I guess I can't say they're all that great, is just top notch. I watched him go back out to a spot and spray a hundred foot strip that he didn't get exactly right. I'm not here to badmouth the spray planes by any means, I just don't know if I've ever seen someone actually care about getting the entire field cover to the highest quality. And that's exactly what they've done for us today. I would imagine, if not by the end of this evening, tomorrow morning, they will finish up a majority of our fungicide spraying. I'd love to just sit here and watch them for the rest of the evening, but I do need to get back and hang out with my family because I've been out here all day witnessing this spectacle. There he goes. It's one thing watching that helicopter spray a big 300 acre field of corn with very few obstructions other than a big power line. He's over here spraying in the trees on much smaller patches and I don't know that I'd be able to keep my nerve doing that. The acrobatics going on there are just top notch. putting $200 worth of diesel fuel in a three-quarter ton heavy-duty truck every week. It makes you ponder the idea of getting an electric car or truck to put around it. Just for the fact that you'd save quite a bit of money. I do think that there is a place for them. I just don't know if it's going to be able to replace high-power, high-torque vehicles for long-term sustainable use. Maybe once we enroll our entire farm into just a complete sheet of solar panels, they'll throw in an electric truck or two for us. Oh, I'm just teasing. You think we'd enroll these farms that we've had for 175 years continuously being tilled or grazed with livestock into solar panels? No way. We definitely are ahead of the curve though. There's very few farms in the Midwest where you're going to find the level of innovation that we have. Not only are we a rain-fed operation, we've also stepped into a completely new terrain, and that's irrigation. That right there, folks, is a nice natural spring. The water has subsided, but last night I was out here walking these beans, pulling a few water hemp that broke through our chemical program, and I noticed a 
pretty substantial stream coming out of the ground here. I'm not gonna lie, I've been pretty surprised with this field of Don Mario 3756E soybeans. Throughout the month of June, they stayed very green, especially compared to their neighboring soybeans in a different field and fields all around. It just didn't seem like the dry weather affected them. And lo and behold, when I was walking out here, I figured out why. Because there was a literally a five gallon a second leak coming out of the ground by our well. As you can see, we're standing in an old cattle feed lot, which was one of many locations for our farm's cattle operation decades ago. We since exited way before my time. Over at Jeff's house, there's also a lot of remnants of the cattle operation. You can see our harvest stores that we don't necessarily use. To keep a five to 600 head cattle operation satiated, we have a pretty substantial well system about a mile to the west on what is aptly named our well farm. And of course, if you're gonna go through all the trouble of installing a highly efficient and productive well, you're gonna make use of it on your houses. So we've got one, two, three, four houses here running off of that well, which isn't even remotely close to testing its capabilities, but it looks like our spur coming up to my parents' house that runs right through here has a leak in the field because it hits kind of in that area, goes down, jogs across to Jeff's, and then basically heads west till it hits our well. The moral of the story here is, just when you think you're out of things to do and you might get to kick your legs up and take it easy, something breaks, like a water line. So we're gonna have to get that fixed. Haven't got this thing out in a hot minute. Which is probably a good thing because almost every project that involves the backhoe is a damaging project or a repair project or some combination of the two. Air conditioning's not working. That's not good. As good as these soybeans look, we may have to get into the irrigation business. Definitely a money maker on a year as dry as this one. Oh, is that plastic? Yeah. Huh. Well, we found it. You're right. I don't remember ever fixing that. I don't either. I do. I do. Yes, I, we do. Because we had cattle, didn't we? You can't blame me. I wasn't around. No, no we were out in the manure fixing it. We secured some supplies to patch up this little piece of water line, and now we're back to it. Line has been patched. Now it's just time for Jeff to go turn the water on and test it. Soybeans look good. Except for those and those. This is a great example of how far down soybean roots go. You can see all the way down there we've got some small roots with root hairs on it. Plants probably two and a half to three foot tall. Roots maybe two foot into the ground. Although this field is very rich with good topsoil and a lifetime of cattle manure. Jeff's headed back and there's no water coming out of the line so to speak of. So we may have fixed this problem or at least temporarily. The boss wants to leave the line exposed for a couple hours, let some water flow through it just to ensure that we have completely fixed the leak before we cover it back up. Which makes sense because you hate to have to dig it up twice, especially because I usually damage the line even more in the process. Of uncovering it. I know there's a lot of times where it seems like I'm just really not up to a whole lot or I don't do a lot of work and although that may be true 10 to 15 percent of the time a lot of what I do especially during the summer is so mundane and repetitive that it's not worth my time to film or your time to watch. That being said just got done spraying some night night juice on some pesky water hemp. Nothing quite gives me the same satisfaction as sending water hemp straight to hell on the express route. I am pretty sweaty though so you can either believe that story, or I was just watching an episode of Cops. That's less than ideal. Wet pants, that's some fun. We got our C8R corn head back from Alliance Tractor today, and they inspected it and didn't find anything wrong with it. My dad was concerned about a noise being made by the auger there, it was kind of whining. He had them look it over while I was still under warranty. They said that that's probably just the way it is. Which is most likely the case because 
both corn heads have made that similar sound since new, before they harvested anything. As of about eight o'clock this morning, the helicopter is completely done on all of our corn acres. We still have a couple of fields of corn that are more higher management, that have a different strategy to producing some higher yields that are gonna be sprayed with the ground rig. That's not happening today. Helicopter's done its job and rather quickly too. Taking bets for how many times my dad has to straighten this thing out to get it in the barn. The trick to these trailers is to make small bites, not try to turn it all at once because then you'll just get yourself jackknifed. Okay, we're at one. Everyone keep track. There's two. Three. Okay, I got a good feeling about this one. Four. During the growing season, so much of what we do involves staying ahead of our crop conditions and scouting out our fields. Obviously, for the ones that are located literally behind where we work every single day, it's not too difficult to see what's going on. But fields like this one 35 miles to the west is a little bit more challenging to get over and take a look at. It also doesn't help that I do not know a single soul over this direction. It'd be very nice to be able to shoot someone a text and ask how much rain there was. That's not the case though. We gotta hop on Route 16, spend about 40-ish minutes in the truck. Not that I need anyone to just constantly check on the crop, but it is really nice, even some of our farms that are just five or 10 miles away from home, to text the neighbor who farms right there and ask them how much rain they got. That way you can have an idea of where the crop's at, what the ground conditions are like, and what just the overall shape of the farm is. No worries though. We made it over west to check out the field. It's not about the quantity of experiences, it's about the quality. There's three main things that we're trying to evaluate out here today. First and foremost, the stage of the corn. Secondarily, the ground conditions out here. And last but not least, we're actually inspecting the standability of the corn. Much like some of our farms back closer to home, earlier on in the year, we had a wind lay over a lot of this corn, which typically results in some elbowing up. Now, when you're spraying with a helicopter, that's not an issue. However, this is one of those higher management fields where the landowner wants to use a ground rig to apply some fungicide and other additive products. So we want to make sure that the ground rig isn't going to run over a bunch of corn due to a stature issue creating obstructions in the row. Ground conditions are very clearly dry or as I'd like to say, passable for the sprayer. This 115 day corn, which was planted second week of May is roughly two weeks away from being brown silk, which is the stage we're wanting to apply the crop protectants to this farm. So we know that. The next question is, can we even get a sprayer through here? In my opinion, the answer is yes. I don't think they're gonna have any problem getting through here. You actually can't even tell that this corn ever laid over. It doesn't really look like there's much disease present out in these fields, which is about par for the course this season. Obviously a few things here and there. Overall though, not enough to be concerned or at least deeply concerned with the amount of disease pressure. I pulled an ear off the plant to evaluate pollination right here. Good spacing between its neighboring plants, so the ear is a very fair representation of the field. Just for the sake of curiosity, I did count the rows around this ear. It was 22 around. I've never in my life seen that out in the middle of the field. I would speculate that we're probably 35 to 40 long. Target population and probably close to the final stand out here is 36,000 plants per acre. A lot of yield potential. I did compare it to the neighboring plant here. This one is 18 around, which is still very impressive, albeit not 22. Did one more sample, took the next plant. It was 20 around. Look at these ears. This is rain fed ground here in central Illinois, arguably not the best ground in the world, but far from the worst. It definitely needs very frequent showers for the soil to stay hydrated and produce a large crop. However, if you do get favorable conditions, it can yield with the best of ground, especially when you're planting very good genetics out here. I'm not gonna necessarily say that we're gonna be blown away by the yield because the combine is always the true measurement of the performance. This corn hybrid though, I believe is Beck 6557 double pro corn. 
our last planted field. Looks pretty good. It always seems like less distance going into the field than coming out. To be fair, I did pick a terrible day to wear jean shorts. That's not helping the cause. This rain is the proverbial icing on the cake for our corn crop. We've already had close to a half an inch and we're just getting warmed up for the next couple days in terms of rainfall. This is gonna pack on the weight in the ears, ensure that we don't run out of moisture and guarantee that we're probably gonna have some pretty substantial yields. Just a real quick update for those of you who do not know, wearing jean shorts to walk fence rows and walk into cornfields, not a great idea. I was itchy the entirety of last night and I've got bug bites all over my legs this morning. So maybe I'll refrain from wearing those unless I'm just putting around in a vehicle all day. Not the best for being out in nature. Over the course of the last two days, we've ended up with about eight tenths of an inch of rainfall total which is about as ideal of a rain as we could ask for this time of year. Nothing too sudden or too fast, and certainly no problems presented from our crop from the amount of moisture. I'm sure that some of you saw that the same storm cell that gave us a nice shower absolutely downpoured on a few other locations. St. Louis, to be exact, got upwards of 10 inches in one storm, which is just absolutely ridiculous. The most rain I've ever seen in one short amount of time or a couple hours is five inches, which is half of what they got. And five inches of rain in a few hours is just a mind blowing amount of water. I can only imagine what they're dealing with down in the St. Louis area is they had 10 inches of rain. That's not even to mention that that's in an urban area with high populations. Unlike out here where we get a five inch rain, well, it's not gonna affect too many people because 95% of our countryside is just fields. We're only gonna lose crops. Hopefully everyone survives down there. There's no major issues. Financially though, I'm sure there'll be substantial damage. It's just crazy to think about. Speaking of expensive, the used equipment market is still absolutely red hot. We have a family friend and farmer that's retiring after this season. He's selling his fleet of equipment. Sullivan Auctioneers, some of you may know their name, handled the auction. It just closed a couple hours ago this morning and the value for some of this stuff is just ridiculous. Just to give you a quick example, his 2013 9510R John Deere 510 horsepower four wheel drive tractor with a little over 900 hours on it went for over $320,000, almost 10 years old. This is very well kept equipment, low hour, hasn't seen a lot of hard use, so it is worth something. We're hoping to unload this 8285R soon it's in great shape low hour and hopefully the market's strong for us as well. That being said, I think it's just a combination of a lack of supply of new tractors and farmers being flush with cash. So those who are in the used market are probably a little bit more willing to shell out some more money to pick up something they see value in. That used equipment in the five to 10 year old range is pretty nice, but the style on these new John Deere tractors, it's just out of this world. I love the look of our 8R370 and I can't wait to get in the field. Anyways, I think that's more than enough excitement for one video. I am going to do something here after I say goodbye that I don't normally do. I probably will have a lot of extra shots of the helicopter that don't make it into the final cut of my more cinematic edit. So after I say bye, I'm gonna throw them at the end. Not really gonna be highly edited. Music's probably not gonna match. For those of you who wanna see more footage though of the helicopter flying, it'll be right after this. Everyone, I do greatly appreciate you tuning in. Like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you wanna see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace.